Psalm 101 says, I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. Good morning to you all and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we welcome you to this recorded service uh, uh, for Bethel United Reformed Church of Elmer for the morning service for April 26. We are grateful that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord in our homes and our households at this time. And we do extend a special welcome to those that might be uh, tuning into this service. And we continue to find ourselves in this unique and strange circumstance uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, but thankfully, we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We are spiritually united to each other. And we do pray and hope that our worship would be acceptable and pleasing to our God, our Father, because of and through the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is the Lord's day, and so let us come into his presence to worship him. And let us do so now in a prayer of preparation, a silent prayer. Amen. Well, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 98. Psalm 98, we read these words. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Congregation, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father, we come into your presence on this, your day, the Lord's day, and we pray that you would cause our worship to be pleasing unto you. We are grateful for the work of our great and our constant intercessor, our high priest, Jesus Christ, who makes our worship perfect in your sight. And so we offer up ourselves as living sacrifices into, to you, we pray that grace, mercy, and peace would be upon us in abundance. In Jesus' name alone, amen. Our opening psalm of adoration is number 103C from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Uh, this has become a beloved setting, uh, song setting of Psalm 103 for our congregation. Come, my soul, and bless the Lord. We'll sing the first four stanzas of number 103C, Come, my soul, and bless the Lord.
God's word declares to us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is an important part of our liturgy, of our worship service, in which we confess our sin before God, in which we examine our own hearts, our own lives, our own motives and motivations, and we compare them to the holiness and the glory of our God. Now, there is a a massive gap. There's an incredible chasm between us and God. We are the creatures. He is the creator. He is the holy one, and we are unholy. And the question really is, how does this bridge get brought together? How can we as sinners come into the presence of a holy God? Well, this is why repentance and confession of sin is necessary. We must confess before God that we cannot meet him on our own terms. The only reason we can approach him is because of what Jesus has done for us, our Savior, and what he has accomplished for us in his perfect life, his atoning death, and powerful resurrection and ascension. So we are brought back to God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ, our Son. This morning we'll be looking at the emotional life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one of the uh, staggering realities about our Savior is that he had a perfect emotional life, in that he had a full emotional life like us, but he never sinned in his emotions. And so as we think about God's law and the perfection of Jesus Christ, we think about how he kept this law, he was made under this law, but fulfilled this law perfectly in every way. And so we hear God's law in Exodus chapter 20 and think of how Jesus has perfectly fulfilled this law on our behalf. And God spoke all these words saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave us a summary of this law. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second great command is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Dear people of God, let us now come before our God in a hymn of confession. This is a setting of Isaiah chapter 40 in which we acknowledge that we have offended God and that we are not deserving of his love and of his grace. But yet, as we acknowledge that, we do look to the Lord for his grace, unmerited favor, and we can receive his word of pardon and his declaration of consolation and comfort. So this is the setting of Isaiah chapter 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, number 298 from our Trinity Psalter hymnal, and we will sing all the stanzas.
Our assurance of pardon is from 1 John 1, verses 8 to 9. We read these words. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to the Lord for his gospel of grace, for this good news. And with that word of pardon, let us come boldly before the throne of grace in a word of congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning on this, your day, the Lord's day, and we are so thankful and grateful for the opportunity that we have to worship you. We have acknowledged this morning that we are undeserving, that we are frail, that we are feeble, and that we have offended your glory and your majesty in what we have done and in the things that we have left undone. Holy Father, we pray that you would cleanse us and that you would purify us as we read here in 1 John chapter 4, that you would change our heart, O Lord, that you would renew our spirits, that we would indeed embrace the grace of repentance, that as we are conformed more and more to your image, that we would hate what you hate and that we would love what you love, and that we would hate our selfishness, that we would hate our pride, that we would hate our consumption about ourselves, and that we would love you, that we would love you and all of your grandeur and all your majesty and all of your beauty who is a god like you who can do all things and who holds all things in his hands heavenly father we do pray that you would continue to give us strength in these uh, usual unusual circumstances relating to COVID-19 we realize that we have been spared much in our own community and in our church family we are thankful that our own community here in uh, Elgin has been able to do well. We are grateful for the steady supply of food and of goods necessary for life. We are thankful that uh, we have been spared um, uh, COVID-19 in terms of an intense outbreak in our community. We pray that we will continue to be kept safe and healthy in this way. We're grateful that you have been near to us as a church family, that uh, you have given us a great love for one another, and that you have given us uh, faith at this time. And although we all and each have moments of anxiety and panic and uh, maybe anger or fretfulness, Lord, we are grateful for the way that you sustain us. We thank you for our leadership, for our elders and deacons that have been faithful in watching over this flock. We thank you for the work that uh, they are doing and others are doing to ensure that we are able to worship together in this way. We're grateful for the gifts and the talents that you have given to those who are involved in putting these services together, and we pray that you would richly be with them and bless them. Lord, help us to, to continue to be united together in love and in the Spirit at this time, to continue to pray for each other and to uphold each other in prayer. Uh, when we have the prodding to make a phone call or to send a text or email of an encouragement to one another, Lord, help us to uh, to make use of that prodding and to use this time in order to love you and to love our neighbor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evidences of grace that we have been able to experience as a congregation. We thank you that Dave and Hilda Knapp can look forward to celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary this coming week. Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for the blessing that they are to us as a congregation, for their ministry among us, and we pray that you would richly bless them and their family as they celebrate and as they continue to honor you and minister in your name as a couple and as a family. Lord, we thank you for all of the marriages of our congregation. We pray that you would protect them from the evil one. We pray that you would preserve them and help us to, as husbands and wives, to love each other as Christ loved the church and to submit to one another as the church submits to Christ. And we pray that we would radiate and mirror this love and this submission that already exists between the church and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord and our God, we do pray for our society, for our nation. We are a country in grieving, grieving because of the, the terrible tragedy in Nova Scotia of the gunmen and of the innocent victims of this uh, terrible evil. We pray for the families of the victims. We pray that you would give them hope and consolation. We 
Pray that you would sustain them and the province of Nova Scotia at this time. Heavenly Father, we understand that we live in a world in which there is much sin and much and many manifestations of evil. Lord, we pray that you would come back quickly. We cry out to you, Maranatha. Lord, we pray that you would make what has gone wrong right and help us to live properly in hope between the time of your first coming and your second coming, between the already and the not yet, and help us to persevere and to endure. Heavenly Father, we do pray uh, for us all and that we would be faithful ambassadors for you at this time. We pray that we would be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others and that we would have the courage and the love to do so. We acknowledge that often the fear of man overcomes the fear of you. And so in these moments in which we might be afraid or even ashamed, help us to love, help us to have good courage. We pray for our own community, for our province, for our nation at this time. We pray for our local municipal governing authorities. Be with them. We pray for our Premier, Doug Ford. We pray for our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Give them and their cabinet leaders and all that who surround them wisdom and discernment in these days ahead. We look forward to being united back together as a church to be able to publicly gather together again. And Lord, we pray that you would hasten this day. You know this day in your perfect timetable and help us now to be patient. And our Heavenly Father, as we will reflect upon the reality of your perfect emotional life and of how you demonstrated anger and sadness and love perfectly, we pray that you would be with us in the teaching of your word and also in the listening of it, listening of it, that we would hear with joy and with faith and that your Holy Spirit would apply your word to our lives. And so we ask for your help and your direction. And we pray this in the precious name and the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our song of preparation, our hymn of preparation, is number 532. Number 532 in our Trinity Psalter hymnals, Be Still My Soul. Be Still My Soul. And we'll sing all four stanzas of number 532, Be Still My Soul. The Lord is on your side.
Our scripture, read, scripture reading for this morning is from John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I invite you to turn to the section of scripture in your Bibles at home, John chapter 11. And the sermon title for today is The Furious Love of Jesus. The Furious Love of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the emotional life of our Lord. And uh, just three, three things to say before we read this passage and uh, reflect upon it. Uh, the first thing is that I'm indebted to Pastor Tim Keller from uh, New York City, who's been the pastor of Redeemer uh, Church, Presbyterian Church in New York City, a PCA congregation for several decades. And he preached a meditation, a sermon on John chapter 11, the Sunday after 9-11, and uh, some of his insights when I first listened to that recording a number of years ago were extremely helpful in opening up this passage and how to uh, encourage and, and how to find encouragement from God's word from John chapter 11. Also, uh, very thankful in, uh, for an article I read in seminary by the Princeton theologian B.B. Uh, Warfield, The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And uh, his uh, very good essay, this is from over 100 years ago, about Jesus' perfect emotional life uh, was extremely helpful in my seminary training. And uh, in thinking about the, the perfect life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this uh, sermon that you're going to hear this morning is uh, a modification of a shorter devotional that I often use when I meet with a family at a funeral home before the visitation, before they receive the, the guests of friends and family of community, community members. And it has um, um, been helpful at, as a word of encouragement to, to God's people in a time of mourning. So our prayer is, and our, our hope is, is that this will be helpful to you in, in this unusual circumstance of COVID-19 and as we deal with an array and assortment of emotions, and may the Spirit of the Lord give us a steadfastness and wisdom as we sort out emotions, the, the healthy ones and the unhealthy ones, and as we seek to live for the glory of God our Father. So with that said, let us read from John chapter 11. This is God's word. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the light in the night, sorry, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb Four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, he shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but he was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Mother, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out and bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. And the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and the nation. And we'll end our reading there. And actually, we'll we'll continue reading. Uh, We'll finish uh, verse 57. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had had given a command that if anyone knew where he, that Jesus, was, he should report it, that they might seize him. This is God's holy word. Congregation love by our Lord and by our Savior, Jesus Christ. It has been several weeks and many days since the provincial lockdown due, the, due to the precautionary measures of COVID-19. And since that time, we have likely had an arrangement and an assortment of different emotions. Maybe we felt very afraid, very fearful. We've had episodes of feeling very sad or discouraged, very despondent. Maybe we've had a season of feeling very angry or resentful. And perhaps there have been periods in which we felt very happy and joyful and thankful that the Lord has used this time Uh, in a good way in our own lives, that we've been able to take stock of his many blessings toward us. We realize how good he has been uh, to us through this and throughout our own lives, his faithfulness. uh, We've been able to see in amazing ways. And so there's been a heart of thanksgiving and of joy. So we've had an arrangement, maybe a kaleidoscopic assortment of emotions, fear, panic, anger, bitterness, resentment, joy, thankfulness, happiness. Why do we have all these various different emotions and affections? Well, it's because God has created us to be emotional beings. We are human creatures. The Lord has given us emotions. And so we have various emotions in response to what is happening to us. 
Now, the question uh, for us this morning is, how do we understand and process these emotions biblically? How do we understand them and evaluate them from a biblical worldview? As we think about our emotions, we can go one of two extremes. We can uh, discount emotions. Uh, We can perhaps not pay attention to them and actually think that they're uh, all wrong. Or we can idolize our emotions. So on the one side, we might discount our emotions. We think of the ancient philosophy of Stoicism in which uh, the mark of a, of a strong individual was to have a stiff upper lip. No matter what happened to you, you just had a stiff upper lip and you were stoic and, and brazen face and you showed no emotion. So uh, in that understanding, emotions are seen as, as a bad thing. So you don't show happiness and you don't show display sadness. The other extreme is to have a sort of idolization of emotions. We might call this a feelism. How we feel is, is ultimate, and so we can actually maybe lose our, our, our reason, and we become slaves of emotions so that our emotions always have the last word. So there can be the negative stream of discounting our emotions, or on the other extreme, we idolize, we, give in to, we think too much about our emotions, particularly our unhealthy emotions. Well, there's good news for us this morning because God's word addresses how we are to understand and evaluate our own emotional lives. And we can do this as we look at the life of our beloved and our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. What we need to remember about Jesus is that he was fully God and fully man. He had to be both fully God and fully man to be our mediator, to be our substitute. And we need to think deeply about the fact that he was fully human, that he had a, a full human body and physique just, just like us. He had a, a human physiology and human psychology and a human uh, body, human physique. He had an emotional life just like we do. There was an intersection between his heart and his mind and his, and his body. And so, boys and girls, simply that means that Jesus was happy. And he got sad. He would get angry that he laughed, that he loved, that he had the full spectrum of emotions like you and I do. But what's so fascinating and amazing is that his emotions were always perfect. They were always without sin. They were never distorted so that we can say of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he was the fully perfect human. And this makes logical sense. He is the second Adam. He is the the image of God par excellence. Now, the one problem that we have as sinners is that sin has affected our emotions. We call this, theologians call this the noetic effect of sin. Sin affects everything. We also think of the the term total depravity. Sin affects our heart, our mind, our emotions, our our motivations, our, our thinking, our feeling, our acting. And so it simply means that we don't always feel as we should. A church father, Augustine, so helpfully labeled sin disordered loves, that our loves get out of order, and that's why we sin. But if we think about Jesus, because he was sinless, his loves were always in perfect order. He felt sadness perfectly. He felt gladness perfectly. He loved others perfectly. He felt anger perfectly. And so there's a lot that we can learn about the emotional life, the perfect emotional life of our Lord. And that's why we've opened up, why we're opening up John chapter 11 uh, this morning because there are three emotions that are present in this passage uh, that we're going to examine for a few moments and make some application uh, regarding it. The emotion of anger, the emotion of sadness, and the emotion of love. Anger, sadness, and love. As we see in Christ Jesus, his perfect emotional love, and specifically the furious love of Jesus. And we'll explore what this means, the furious love of Jesus Uh, Anger, sadness, and love. So first of all, anger. Anger. First emotion that we 
we'll examine is this emotion of anger. Now, this is the story from, as recorded by the disciple of Jesus, John. And what has occurred here, as we've read together, is that Lazarus, the, the dear friend of Jesus, and the brother of Martha and Mary, has died. And so Jesus is approaching the tomb. He is coming to the tomb. And understand that in the ancient world, in Jesus' day, when uh, someone has died, there would be professional wailers. There would be uh, uh, individuals who were particularly hired to let out loud screams and cries of, of mourning and of grieving. This was part of the, the burial process and the, the rituals involved in a funeral so that they would uh, properly grieve the loss of a loved one. Now, the question I have for you is, what emotion did Jesus have as he approached the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus? And, and what emotion did he display when he saw Mary weeping over the loss of her brother? Look at verse 33. It says, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, the professional mourners, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And then just verse 38, a couple of verses later, it says, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. What we learn from this text, from this Greek word here, is that Jesus had a very strong and a apparent visible response when he saw Mary, the brother of Lazarus, weeping and crying. The original Greek word here is a bimonomai, which actually has the connotation of, of snorting in animals. So you think of a snorting of a, of a horse as the excitement as it goes into battle or it's under a heavy load. So this was an intense upsurge of emotion. It was audible, meaning that you could hear it. It was loud, and it was very visible in Jesus' look, his tone of voice, and this sort of this uh, constant sign. So you could see and hear that he was visibly angry, that he was visibly upset, that he was visibly distressed. So this is in the emotion of intense Anger, and it was very clear and obvious. Now, what is Jesus angry about? What, he is, what is he furious at? Well, we want to be very clear is that he's not angry at Mary and Martha and the professional weepers at being sad. It's not that he's walking into the scene and, and thinking, oh, you ladies, uh, stop, being, stop crying. Stop being so sad. Come on, just... You don't, don't you know who I am? Trust the Lord that he's going to work all things out. Stop your crying. No, he's not at all. We're going to see this in our second point. He is not angry at the mourners and those who are crying. No, he is angry at death itself. He is angry at the tomb. Meaning he is angry at what sin has done to his good world. That Jesus saw in death an alien intrusion, alien intrusion into the, the good and the perfect world that he had made. And we, and this, is, this is accurate, right? When we think about we had Eden, paradise, and the effect of sin on the world, that death is not natural. Death is an enemy. It is the last enemy. And death affects all of us, and death is a terrible thing. And the process of death is a, is a horrible thing. And so Jesus is angry at sin and the effect of sin on his good world. B.B. Warfield, the Princeton theologian, uh, as I mentioned earlier, said that it brought home to him, the, to his consciousness, the evil of death. Calvin would say that the violent tyranny of death. So he burns with rage against this oppressor, death, and behind death, the devil, evil. He raged against the dying of the light, of the night. And so in Mary's grief, 
He contemplates the general misery of the whole human race and the causes of it. This is not the way it was supposed to be. But, now there's a big, big but here. There is a a justness to Jesus' anger. There is a righteousness, a, a perfection to his anger. That Jesus' perfect anger prevents him from flying off the handle. And this is how Jesus' perfect anger, his perfect emotion of anger, is very different from our often unrighteous anger. You know, Jesus doesn't fly off the handle here. Now he's, he's visibly agitated and angry. But it's, it's controlled. B.B. Warfield says, he said, the emotion which tore his breast and clamors for utterance was just rage. The expression of this rage was strongly curbed. And even the, the juxtaposition of the, of the terms here is, uh, is important because the, the Greek word, as it says here, uh, he bristled in spirit or he groaned in the spirit, and then it says he was troubled, or that means that he, he groaned inside. It, it underlines the connotation that Jesus was master of his circumstance, that the expression of his fury, as, as obvious as it was, was restrained. So he was visibly troubled, but he was stirred inside. So he restrained his emotions in that sense. So there's a perfect balance in Jesus' emotional life. Calvin says of this text, He says, for the reason why our feelings are sinful is that they rush on without restraint and they suffer no limit. But in Christ, the feelings were adjusted and regulated in obedience to God and were altogether free from sin. He had no passion or affection of his own that ever went beyond its proper bounds. He had not one that was not proper and founded on reason and sound judgment. It's very helpful what the reformer says here. Jesus was perfect in his emotions because he never overreacted and he never underreacted. His emotions were always in perfect obedience to God. And that's very humbling for us because as we think about our own emotional lives, so often the emotions that we experience get the better of us. We overreact or we underreact when, we, and when it comes to anger, this emotion that we're speaking about. We can become overreactive when others... Um, treat us in a way that we were not hoping or expecting, when we don't get our way, when we feel slighted, that we overreact and we explode. This is the dynamite of anger. And, and sadly, anger, this emotion that we have, often hurts the closest ones to us, those whom we love the most deeply. And sometimes it's simply our pride got wounded. Our pride, our ego gets hurt. And so when we lash out in anger simply because our pride our ego gets hurt. It shows our sin. Now, this is not all bad news. It just means that we need to repent. We need to repent to the Lord of our our angry hearts. We need to repent, ask for forgiveness of our loved ones whom we have hurt. But this just shows our sin. Um, On the other side, sometimes we can not get angry enough righteously. Sometimes, as Christians, we need to get more angry toward evil. We think about racial prejudice, social injustice. Sadly and tragically, the callous killing of human fetuses in the womb of our land. Uh, We think about the cynical wickedness of those involved in the slave trade of of pimps and those who traffic other human beings and, and, and hurt them. We think of drug pushers and others involved in other acts of terrible wickedness and debauchery, those who make a lot of money preying on the weaknesses of other individuals at the cost of their own ruin. See, there's a lot of societal ills that we should be righteously angry at. And brothers and sisters, we we need to be careful that we just don't throw a grenade at the big bad world and get angry at the evils of the big bad world. We need to be angry against our own sin. Have a righteous anger against our own hearts of really unrighteous anger and of bitterness and of resentfulness. We need to be angry at our own sin to hate what the Lord hates. And so we need to have a righteous anger and a proper sense of outrage. So we need to have a balanced view of 
the emotion of anger. And that's what we learn here in the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Secondly, we want to look at the tears of Jesus, namely the sadness of Jesus. Boys and girls, what is the shortest verse in the Bible? (laughs) The shortest verse in the Bible is right before you. Maybe you see it. Two words, verse 35, Jesus wept. Two short words, but full of implication and meaning. Verse 34 says, and he, Jesus said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He cried tears. Understand when Jesus reaches Mary, she asks him a major theological question. Where were you? Where were you? Sorry, this is verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she has come before him and she's weeping. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, why weren't you here? Jesus, you could have, you could have stopped this. Now, now Jesus doesn't, e- doesn't even answer the question. The question that she poses to him. She says, where is he? Where have you laid him? Lord, come and see. And as he sees, and he weeps, he cries tears, he is deeply moved, he is troubled. Jesus wept. Two words, but a lot to unpack. You know, there's a saying, it's not very helpful and it's not true. Real men don't cry. Real men don't cry. It's not true. Real men do cry. Jesus was a real man, fully human. He was the best man. He was the perfect man. And he did cry. Now, this reaction is a bit startling, though. Two reasons. Because Jesus, now we can understand that someone would cry properly, would grieve appropriately when his friend has died. But it's a little surprising that Jesus weeps publicly for two reasons, although it's fully natural to weep. Because Jesus comes to the tomb with two things that you and I don't have. First of all, he comes with perfect knowledge. He knows what has happened, why this has happened, and what's going to happen. He knows that he's going to turn this all around in about 10 minutes into a manifestation of the Father's glory. He knows that he's going to raise his friend from the dead and everything is going to be happy and blissful again. You know, when we enter into situations of grief, when we come to a funeral of a beloved friend, we, we don't know that in 10 minutes everything's going to turn out fine and dandy. And that's the second thing that Jesus has that we don't have. He has the power to do something about the problem. You know, you and I can't raise a friend from the dead. You and I can't resurrect a loved one from the dead. We don't have that ability. So Jesus has ultimate power, complete ability, and he has perfect knowledge. He knows that in 10 minutes, everything is going to be turned around. Everybody's going to be happy and all is good. Why does he cry here then? Boys and girls, why does Jesus cry? Can you guess? If you knew that you, be, that you could turn everything around, would you cry? Why does Jesus cry? Jesus cries because he is perfect. Because he is perfect. Because he is perfect love. Love walked among us in the person and the ministry of Jesus. Which means this. Jesus is not even going to close his heart for 10 minutes. He is not going to refuse to enter in. He's not going to say, I'm not going to let grief get to me, although I'm going to turn it all around for good. No, he goes in. He enters in. The heartache and the heartbreak and the sadness and the sorrow and the tears. And that's a lesson for us. Our calling to enter into other people's suffering, other people's grief to weep with those who weep. Sometimes we might just be afraid to do that. 
But we have this example of love in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so there is a lesson here for funerals. You know, we don't come into a visitation and stop saying, okay, everybody stop crying. Why all these tears? No, we cry, we weep, we console, just like Jesus did. And it's also amazing here as we think about what Jesus does here is that Jesus was not ashamed to be human. Can Jesus is all powerful, all powerful? He could have he could have held back his tears. He could have thought, real men don't cry, I'm not gonna cry. No. He's not ashamed to be human. He's not ashamed to cry. He's not ashamed to look weak and weeping. What he does here is that he identifies with his dear friends, Mary and Martha. He knows their hearts are so troubled and so downcast. And so he is perfect empathy and he is perfect sympathy and so he identifies with them in their heartache and heartbreak he doesn't remain aloof and so he is pleased to identify with his people and brothers and sisters that is a real encouragement for us as we think that jesus is not ashamed to call us as brothers and sisters he is not ashamed when you are sad he's not ashamed of you when you are grieving Rather, he enters into your grief and he comforts you with his presence and with his power. Why? Because of his love. Because of his love. And that's the third emotion we want to explore this morning for just a few moments. Look at verse 36. Verse 36. And the Jews said, see, these are all all the people around, see how he loved him. See how he loved him. And there's 37 And some of them said, Could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind, also have kept this man from dying? It's very obvious to those who witnessed this event that Jesus deeply loved Lazarus. But then they wondered, why didn't he keep him from dying? Why didn't Jesus just prevent all this grief? Well, we know, because we know the end of the story, is that Jesus is going to demonstrate and display his power in an even more majestic way. He will raise him from the dead. He will demonstrate that he himself is the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus proceeds to the tomb, and he has tears of sympathy which are filling his eyes, his soul is being held by rage. We see verse 35, he, uh, he says, then coming to the tomb, groaning in himself, he continues to be angry, visibly agitated, but he goes to the tomb to do what? In order to fight. Calvin says he advances to the tomb as a champion who prepares for conflict. And right there, Jesus fights the enemy, the enemy of death. He goes eye to eye with the enemy of death and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He demonstrates his power and his triumph over the enemy of death by resurrecting Lazarus from the tomb. This is because of Jesus' love. It's because of Jesus' love for his dear friend Lazarus and Lazarus' sisters, his dear friends Mary and Martha, that Jesus does this. And also to demonstrate his power and his might. See how he loved him. But realize, congregation, what he's doing here is substitutionary. This is his love in, in, a, in, in a substitutionary way. Because he raises Lazarus from himself, he himself will die. He's going to bring suffering on his life. I should have read from verse 53. I should have read the, the rest of the chapter. But what we have after this episode of him at raising Lazarus from the dead, that Jesus' enemies plot to take his life. Verse 53 says, Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. From that day on, they plotted to put him to death. This is the perfect architecture of Jesus' life. Now that Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, his enemies are saying, he's got to go. This man, Jesus, this man of ministry and of mercy, is a dangerous man. He's a threat upon our own power. And the whole world is going to go after him, as John says in another place. 
We got to get rid of him. And so these enemies of Jesus are not going to stop in the plotting of Jesus' murder and death until Jesus is on the cross. And Jesus knows this. He is fully aware of this. And so he makes this choice. The only way that he's going to interrupt Lazarus' funeral is to cause his own. The only way to bring Lazarus out of the grave is to bury himself in the grave. The only way he could get Lazarus out of death was for he himself, Jesus, to be killed. And Jesus knows that. And that's the picture of the gospel. As I said, this is the great exchange. This is the substitutionary work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that our God is so committed to ending ending suffering and evil and death so much that he is willing to incarnate himself into the suffering world, this world of pain and of suffering and of disease and of death, and to share in that suffering and death himself in order to destroy it ultimately. That is the furious love of Jesus. In his anger and fury against sin and the devil and death, he will enter into it in order to conquer it, in order to defeat it once and for all. And that's what he's going to do. And that's the marvelous nature of this resurrection, of his own resurrection, which is going to happen soon. He's going to turn this death into a resurrection. He's going to bring out of this something even greater than there was before. And that's the gospel storyline, that out of the cross comes resurrection, that out of weakness comes strength, that out of tears comes triumph, and out of service to others comes true identity. So see this beautiful, wonderful Savior. See this perfect emotional life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and and learn from him, and and watch him, and, and believe in him, that he indeed is the man of sorrows who has come to ultimately take away all of our sorrows. So may there be a sanctification in our our emotions. May we be angry at the right things proportionally. When we have sadness, let us understand that sadness, but let us have sadness, but not without hope. But let us also love. Love God, love our neighbor in a substitutionary way. And so may the Spirit give us this strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, and we thank you for the manifestation of your love in that you died in our place on the cross. And so we pray that you would help us as we seek to uh, live for you, help us to surrender ourselves to your Lordship in every way. And we pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Let us now sing our song of response, number 516, number 516. This was our song of the month uh, a few months ago. Alleluia, alleluia. What can separate me from my, my soul from the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing. Hallelujah. Number 516, we'll sing all the stanzas.
We'd have the opportunity to worship the Lord in the giving of his tithes and our offerings. Uh, we continue to ask that you set apart uh, the Lord's tithes and your offerings for the work of the church and of, his, in a, and of his kingdom. And today, the offering is for the general fund for our church, and the second offering is for New Horizons. This is the ministry of Reverend Mitch Prasad and Scarborough. So let's say a short prayer for, for this offering. Heavenly Father, we understand that all that we are and all that we have belongs to you and that we belong to you in life and in death and body and soul. And so we take what already belongs to you, our time, our treasure, our talents, and we give it back to you for the work of the kingdom and the work of the church. And we're grateful for the fact that we can partner with Reverend Mitch Prasad in Scarborough. We're grateful for the work that he has been doing there for uh, many years and how you are causing this congregation to grow and to, to be united in love and in unity. And so we pray that you would richly uh, bless them as, as a gathering and as a community of faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. A doxology is number 117a, number 117a, Praise Jehovah All the Nations, number 117a. Let's now close the service in a moment of a final prayer, prayer of benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for blessing us with your presence, and we pray that your presence would continue to be with us, that you would shine your face upon us, that you would give us your peace. We pray this in your almighty name alone. Amen.